All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining our Tech COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, today, uh, very excited to bring you this webinar. I think it's uh, absolutely timely with the amount of COVID we have in our country and the influenza season starting. So hopefully we can give you uh, some insights of what to maybe expect and how to navigate through that. So this is our agenda today and we will uh, wait and introduce the speakers as they present today. I am Shelly Sweetelm and I'm at the Nebraska Medical Center and I have accountability in NETEC uh, from a program uh, perspective to be one of the program directors and subject matter experts. And I'm really excited to uh, be your host today. And this is our uh, mission statement for NETEC that we've set to advance uh, the gold standard for special pathogen preparedness and response across healthcare delivery systems with the goals of really driving best practices, closing knowledge gaps, and developing innovative resources. So these are our areas of focus in NETEC, and I won't spend much time on them, but we do everything from consultation. So if you have a question that you need some technical assistance with, uh, we have some metrics that we've worked on from a, doing a self-assessment perspective. We have on-site and remote guidance that we're working through. Uh, we have um, lots of different opportunities available that if you have a facility that you would really like us to connect with to better advance uh, their special pathogen preparedness, we're willing to uh, get on the Zoom call these days and hopefully eventually get back to doing in-person site visits as well. Then our education arm brings you this webinar today. Uh, we've done in-person courses in the past, but have been bringing those to you mostly in the form of podcasts and webinars since uh, COVID pretty much uh, brought a halt to a lot of the, the travel across the uh, US. We have an online repository, so don't start uh, something new. Uh, it's most likely that we have a template out there for you to just take and customize. We have exercise templates available for you to just sort of plug and play. And then we have a research network that we've created. And it's really the infrastructure behind uh, doing special pathogen research should we need to, which was very helpful in the early days of COVID. So today it's my pleasure to introduce a close colleague of mine, Dr. Mark Rupp. He's the professor of the Department of Internal Medicine section of infectious disease at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He's also the medical director for the Department of Hospital Healthcare Epidemiology and co-director of our antimicrobial stewardship program. So over to you, Dr. Rupp. Tully, thanks so much. And um, I'm just really pleased to share the podium today with uh, Dr. Uecki and Dr. Uh, Simonson. And uh, I've got a lot to cover. So uh, without further ado, let's just get going. So next slide, please. So um, I think everybody's aware that last year was just a non-event as far as our flu season. And you can see that on, on this slide that tracks the uh, prevalence of influenza throughout the country, several seasons. And you can look at the far right-hand uh, part of the slide and see that the 2020-21 season uh, really never got above threshold with regard to influenza-like illness throughout the United States. Now, we don't really fully understand why this is the case. Uh, probably has to do with a lot of the measures we were doing to uh, prevent the spread of COVID. But I think this virus has really uh, humbled a lot of us. And there clearly are some very um, unknown viral dynamics and how this virus interacts with human populations. And undoubtedly, uh, that played a large role in this as well. But I think we can say that it would be quite foolish and very reckless for us to assume that we're not going to see a resurgence of influenza this season. Now, the other thing that uh, many of you who are working in hospitals don't me need me to tell you, but the uh, hospital census is very, very high, and we have very little additional surge capacity within the system. You can see on the right-hand side of this slide an awful lot of orange and yellow and red that shows that uh, the census is high throughout the country. And then here in my own backyard, Douglas County, you can see on the left-hand side of this slide where throughout our metropolitan area, we're operating at about 90 to a little over 90% of our uh, hospital uh, uh, capacity is uh, full. So just some summary statements that uh, influenza and COVID-19 have a significant overlap in their clinical presentation. And we're gonna go over that just briefly. That the treatment and the infection prevention measures to some extent can be different. So it's very important to try to differentiate these two pathogens. Uh, unfortunately, they can occur together. And I'll show you some information about that. And as I already mentioned, the healthcare system is already critically stressed. 
Uh, so it's imperative upon us to try to prevent as much influenza as we possibly can uh, by giving uh, in, uh, influenza vaccination uh, throughout the population. Uh, just like it's critically important to continue to try to get COVID-19 vaccination throughout the population. So uh, reasons why we may see a resurgence of influenza here this season are that uh, people are just tired of doing the non-pharmacologic interventions uh, to prevent COVID. And um, uh, we think that this had a impact last year on influenza, but we certainly can't count on it this year because I think a lot of folks have just sort of given up and hope that the pandemic is over and thrown caution to the winds and have stopped their social distancing, their masking, their hand hygiene. In addition, as we get into the colder months, we're gonna see more indoor activity, more shared uh, air spaces. And we also have waning immunity from previous uh, infections or vaccination for, for flu. Now the next uh, several slides kind of uh, very, very briefly summarize a comparison between influenza and COVID-19. You can see influenza on the left, COVID-19 on the right. Uh, clearly they're different pathogens. I think the more we learn about these respiratory viruses, the more we realize that they are spread fairly similarly through uh, respiratory droplets and increasingly an appreciation for uh, small droplet aerosols. Uh, the the period of uh, being contagious is different for the viruses. Um, so fo folks with flu are contagious for a day or two before they start having symptoms. And this tends to uh, fall off relatively rapidly and ceases by about day five to seven. For uh, COVID-19, uh, again, people are contagious prior to showing any symptoms. And obviously what's made this virus so difficult is that many people uh, continue to have mild symptoms or no symptoms, but can be very uh, uh, contagious and can transmit the virus. This level of being contagious uh, generally lasts longer than it does for flu and uh, can go out to 10 days or more, particularly in those who are immunosuppressed. The risk factors for severe disease are very similar amongst both these diseases, and I don't really need to go over that in great detail. And I think uh, people who are older, younger, uh, folks who have underlying immunosuppressive disorders, um, people who are obese, uh, et cetera, uh, the, the known risk factors that we have for both of these viruses. Next slide. Symptoms uh, tend to peak uh, fairly early with influenza within a few days of uh, becoming ill and then start to come down. And again, by about day five to seven, uh, they've stopped shedding the virus. Uh, for COVID, uh, things take a little bit of a longer course. And uh, typically people uh, go along with mild symptoms for some time, and then uh, they tend to get sicker in their, in their second and third weeks, uh, those that are going to uh, decompensate and come into our hospitals. Uh, you can also see some unusual symptoms with COVID-19, although both viruses will cause sometimes perturbations in people's ability to taste or smell. This is particularly uh, characteristic of COVID-19. And frankly, anybody who uh, comes in telling you that they're having changes in those senses uh, is COVID-19 until proven otherwise. In addition, there's probably uh, more of the long hauler syndrome, as we're calling it with COVID, uh, than you see with influenza. And this can be quite troublesome and last for weeks, if not months. Um, the pediatric uh, aspects of the disease, I think I'll just wait till later when Dr. Simonson uh, covers that in her uh, portion of the presentation. And the case fatality rate you can see is, is relatively low with both of these viruses, um, and uh, thankfully so, but uh, tends to be uh, you know, somewhere probably 10 times worse with COVID-19. The uh, treatment is obviously very different. And uh, luckily we have a number of uh, uh, pharmacologic agents for treating influenza now, uh, particularly the neuraminidase inhibitors. Uh, we've uh, sort of abandoned some of the uh, amantadine, rimantadine, uh, M2 blocker uh, uh, drugs uh, for flu because of some of their side effects, but occasionally they're still uh, useful. And then we have the uh, endonuclease inhibitors, the belalaxivir that uh, we've started using with flu. Uh, likewise, with COVID-19, uh, it's been very gratifying to see the uh, uh, really nice uh, work that's been done by so many people to uh, bring some of the therapeutics for COVID-19 uh, onto the market. And you can see those listed on this slide. And then uh, likewise, it's been very gratifying to see vaccines come forward with COVID-19 that are very, very effective, uh, very, very safe, and similar to influenza, um, uh, having vaccines for influenza now for decades. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, influenza and COVID-19 can occur together. And uh, this is uh, brought out in this uh, meta-analysis that was recently published, a number of studies that you can see listed here, 
Uh, the bottom line is that the, the rate of co-infection in these studies uh, was anywhere from about 0.2% uh, all the way up to 45%. And overall, it was a little bit less than 1%. Now, clearly, these studies were done in 2020 when we really just weren't seeing flu uh, being circulating in the community. And therefore, uh, we can't count on it being that low again this year. Uh, so the, the bottom line is that they can exist together. We're going to need to be watching for that. Now, one of the other effects of COVID-19 has been that, unfortunately, it's really impacted vaccination for other diseases. And that's shown in this slide with some of our pediatric uh, vaccinations in 10 different U.S. states and municipalities. And um, what I'm concerned about with this is that some of the backlash against COVID-19 vaccine that we're seeing, it become uh, such a polarized uh, uh, topic in our society that I'm afraid that this is going to also spill over into influenza vaccination and that people um, are just going to become uh, anti-vaccination in their orientation in general. And we may not see the uptake for influenza vaccination this year uh, that uh, we've had in, in last year's. And it's already too low, and I'm afraid that it's just going to be lower again. So uh, many people try to time when they get the influenza vaccine, and the question is, when's the best time? Uh, the bottom line is it's, you know, uh, any vaccine in the fall is better than not at all. Um, but the things that people need to be uh, aware of is that it takes about two weeks to develop uh, protective immunity after you get the flu vaccine that it tends to peak about six to eight weeks after you get the vaccine. And it tends to wane over time uh, with, uh, as you can see in this study, about a seven to 10% decline uh, per month. Now on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see um, when influenza epidemics tend to peak uh, in the United States. And um, you know sometimes they come early and you might even see uh, an early season in October or November. Sometimes they uh, uh, go well into the spring with March and April. But for the most part, they tend to peak in somewhere in the neighborhood of January or February. And so getting your uh, flu vaccine uh, right now, uh, you know, from mid-October to about mid-November is just perfect timing. Now, this also shows the uh, effectiveness of the flu vaccine. And you can see it's not a perfect vaccine by a long shot. Uh, but in general, uh, what I tell people is it's about 50% effective. And it kind of, uh, you know, varies from year to year, as you can see in this slide. But the bottom line is that uh, influenza vaccine is a good deal for us and that it prevents an awful lot of morbidity and some degree of mortality. Uh, that data is summarized here in this slide where the CDC has brought forth data uh, looking at the 2019-2020 season where the vaccine effectiveness was about 40%. So it wasn't a great year for effectiveness, but uh, again, in the ballpark of what we're used to seeing. Uh, but the estimate, estimation is that it prevented 7.5 million illnesses, over 100,000 hospitalizations, and saved over 6,000 lives. Uh, this is clearly in our best interest as a society to get as many people vaccinated for flu as we possibly can, particularly as we're staring the continuing uh, COVID-19 pandemic in the face. Now, I'm going to try to, uh, to do justice for this next series of slides, but I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. And the, the reason for going through these is that uh, some people have been asking questions as to whether uh, influenza vaccine has some sort of a detrimental effect on COVID-19. Uh, this was particularly um, seen uh, last year when there was some uh, data that showed in military recruits, for instance, that people who had received influenza vaccine were more likely to then develop non-COVID-19 uh, coronavirus infections. Um, in addition, there's been uh, hypothesized uh, immunologic effects uh, with the antibody dependent uh, uh, enhancement that people who got the flu vaccine might actually get more severe COVID-19. Um, actually, the opposite of that has been borne out in a number of studies. So this is one study that came out of the University of Michigan that looked at a large cohort of patients um, that they then followed. And as you can see on the graphical aspect of this, that uh, hospitalization, mechanical ventilation, and uh, hospital stay were all better in people who had received the influenza vaccine and then developed COVID-19. And then these are some very interesting studies, the next two slides, that uh, show the real value of some of these large uh, databases and the ability to uh, query uh, electronic medical records. Uh, so this is a, a study looking at almost 75 million hospitalized uh, hospital records. Uh, 
Uh, these investigators found two cohorts that they followed more closely of almost 38,000 patients in each who had received influenza six months to two weeks prior to then developing COVID-19. And they looked at uh, adverse outcomes at days 30, 60, 90, and 120. They did propensity matching for all kinds of things that could confound uh, that uh, comparison. And what you can see um, looking at the, the columns on the left-hand side of this figure compared to those on the right, uh, the folks on the left-hand side had not received flu vaccine. The folks on the right had received flu vaccine. And so you can see in these patients that they had a higher risk of sepsis, a higher risk of having a stroke, a higher risk of ICU admission, a higher risk of DVT, and a higher risk of coming into the emergency department. So uh, getting the flu vaccine actually seems to make your subsequent COVID-19 infection more manageable. And then using exactly the same database, uh, they did the same comparison in persons who then underwent surgery. And again, the same color schemes, uh, the same arrangement, you can see that uh, the, the risk for uh, post-surgical sepsis, for DVT, for surgical wound dehiscence, and for um, MI risk was all less in patients who had received influenza vaccine and then developed COVID-19 and then underwent surgery. So again, really strong data that getting the flu vaccine is a good deal for you, uh, even if you're looking at what its effects might be on subsequent COVID-19. And then please go to the next slide and I'll, I'll try to do this one justice as well, but this is uh, fairly complex. So uh, this was a study in which they looked at county level data throughout the United States. And they looked at each of the counties, uh, the, the number of people over the age of 65 who had received influenza vaccine. And then they looked in those counties at COVID-19 mortality. And, and obviously there's all kinds of confounders that can uh, uh, you know, uh, make that comparison more difficult. And you can see on the left-hand side of this slide, all the different confounding variables that were looked at. They did then did propensity scoring comparisons trying to winnow out those confounders. And on the right-hand side of this slide, what you can see is that when they stratified their populations in, in various ways, when they looked at their influenza vaccine and stratified it in, in a lot of different ways, that for every 10% increase in influenza vaccination, they saw a decrease in COVID-19 mortality within those counties. And I don't have time to go into it in any greater detail, but you can see again on the right-hand portion of that figure that in looking at the, the uh, influenza vaccinated populations in various ways, in every instance, as you increased influenza vaccination, you had a decrease in the mortality due to COVID-19. So again, really strong uh, data to support that people should get both the flu vaccine and again, as well as the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, so if you're setting up your influenza clinics, um, this uh, shows what you need to be considering for that. So you wanna screen patients before they come in, make sure they're not sick already and bringing COVID into your clinic. You wanna limit the degree and duration of contact with your patient. Make sure that you're having face coverings for all the patients as well as all the personnel, and the personnel should be wearing eye protection. Hand hygiene, try to get physical distancing, give people specific appointment times, and then try to use electronic means to communicate and to register, et cetera. And then uh, again, I'll briefly summarize this table, but it's pretty uh, uh, jammed. And so you can see across the top, the different kinds of patient settings where you might be considering whether to give flu vaccine or not. So you could have patients fully vaccinated with no known contact with a, a COVID-19 contact. You've got patients who are not fully vaccinated with contact patients with asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic uh, COVID-19, and then patients with symptomatic COVID-19. That's across the top of the slide. On the left-hand side, you can see the various settings where you might be considering giving flu vaccine. So the outpatient center, emergency department, inpatient acute care, congregate healthcare settings, and correctional detention centers, and the like. And you can see that in those patients that are fully vaccinated with no known close contact, go ahead and vaccinate all of them uh, as much as you possibly can. For the patients with close contact, you can go ahead and vaccinate them, but patients should not be coming into your outpatient care solely for the purpose of getting vaccinated. So those people, you wanna tell them to stay home for a little bit longer, get over their 
period of quarantine and then come in and get vaccinated. It's pretty much the same thing with uh, asymptomatic or presymptomatic uh, disease. Uh, and then again, in the far right-hand column, uh, it's really deferring people who are acutely ill until they can more safely get vaccinated. And that's pretty much down the board. Now I'll close with this slide just to show you that we're not in the flu season yet, but we're starting to, to see sporadic cases. And you, undoubtedly this will pick up as we go through uh, additional weeks. So now's the time to make that final push to get people uh, vaccinated against influenza. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ueki to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, uh, testing and treatment. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Rupp, for that great evidence-based presentation there and for kind of busting through one of the, the myths that we've been hearing for sure. So next, it's my uh, honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tim Ueki. And uh, Dr. Ueki is one of those icons in infectious disease and particularly uh, influenza. So he spent 23 years at the CDC, and we greatly appreciate his uh, expertise and willingness to participate today. So Dr. Ueki, over to you. Thanks so much. Next slide. So Dr. Rupp has very nicely covered this, and I'll just try to pick out a few points that when there is co-circulation of influenza viruses and SARS-CoV-2, there is the potential for co-infection. Um, it's not probably not common, but it can occur. And as uh, he pointed out, it's been documented in case reports and case series. Um, there is a study from the UK that was done at the end of um, 2019, early 2020, when there was good co-circulation to suggest that actually if you have co-infection, um, with influenza viruses and SARS-CoV-2, you actually um, have a greater risk for more severe disease. And then um, Dr. Rupp also highlighted the issues about, from a clinical perspective, it's very, very difficult to distinguish between either virus infection or co-infection. Um, and just to uh, reemphasize a few points that the incubation period is much shorter for influenza um, and that the period of viral RNA detection and viral shedding is also shorter for influenza than it is for COVID-19. Disorders of taste and smell are more common with COVID-19 than influenza. It, it's not that it cannot happen with influenza, it's uncommonly reported. And then from the uh, gastrointestinal um, point of view, diarrhea can occur uh, typically with young children with influenza, but um, with COVID-19, diarrhea can occur at any age. Uh, and as he pointed out, the timing of the onset of complications uh, is later with COVID-19. It's, it's much earlier with um, influenza. And as he also pointed out, the high-risk groups for influenza and COVID-19 in terms of severe complications are very similar. I would just emphasize that young children are um, at high risk for influenza complications, particularly the younger you are, especially less than two years of age. And um, we don't typically uh, see so much severe disease in this um, less than five population uh, with COVID-19. Next slide. So there are a number of um, different tests that are available to detect influenza viruses um, in respiratory specimens in different clinical settings. And there, there are a lot of differences in terms of the time to yield results, what information is actually provided, what um, respiratory track specimens are actually uh, approved or um, uh, recommended, and then what clinical setting can you use the test. But most importantly, it's really the accuracy that um, um, may differ, and in particularly, this, it's the sensitivity, because most of the tests are all have pretty high specificity, but it's the um, sensitivity that can vary, and particularly the antigen detection assays um, have lower sensitivity than the nucleic acid detection assays, or we refer to them as molecular assays. Um, and prior to the pandemic, there were clearly um, uh, antigen detection and molecular assays for influenza viruses um, that were uh, cleared by FDA. And now with the COVID-19 pandemic, FDA has uh, authorized through emergency use authorization, both antigen detection and uh, molecular assays that can also detect influenza viruses along with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, some of these assays are, um, uh, uh, can be used at the point of care in any clinical setting. Some of them are moderately complex and require a, a clinical laboratory. Some of them are 
designated as highly complex, which require large clinical laboratories or public health laboratories. So um, prior to the pandemic, um, this is sort of a, um, a, a description of the FDA cleared test to detect influenza viruses, and they all detect influenza A and B, um, and they can differentiate between influenza A and B. Um, there are clearly some um, multiplex assays that could detect other uh, viruses. But, um, you know, before this pandemic, we saw a lot of use of the rapid antigen tests um, and less use of the molecular assays. And I think that really the future is really moving towards rapid molecular assays. And the reason is because of the higher sensitivity. So just to highlight the rapid molecular assays um, can be used in outpatients and in the emergency department, uh, can also be used for hospitalized patients as well. In terms of the available assays, you can get a result in about 15 to 30 minutes with pretty high uh, sensitivity. Um, and there are these other uh, multiplex assays that may be uh, useful as well in hospitalized patients. Now, with um, the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been all these other multiplex assays that have been authorized that also detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza viruses. And uh, I'll just... Um, highlight some of these. So we do have um, some rapid uh, antigen tests that also detect SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A and B that can be used in outpatients at point of care uh, settings. There are rapid molecular assays that can yield um, uh, results in 20 to 45 minutes that can be used in the ED in the clinic, also in hospitalized patients. Um, and then there are other multiplex assays, including large respiratory panels that can detect a lot more viruses and actually some bacterial pathogens. And there's a variable time for those. Those are really um, some of the, the, the tests that uh, take much more time um, to produce results, really are more for hospitalized patients because they're not probably not going to uh, provide timely results to inform clinical management. So what tests are recommended? So um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Infectious Diseases Society of America um, clinical practice guidelines recommended that rapid influenza molecular assays are recommended over antigen detection tests, and that's because of the higher sensitivity of the rapid molecular assays. Now, with the COVID-19 pandemic, there clearly are situations like now when there may be, we're, we're getting into influenza season, there's sporadic influenza virus detection throughout the U.S., very low activity, but we, um, we are concerned that that's likely to increase. So multiple assays that detect um, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A and B viruses can be useful. And the uh, NIH COVID-19 um, treatment guidelines panel recommends influenza testing and SARS-CoV-2 testing in outpatients with acute respiratory illness if the results will change management of the patient. One example is um, decisions to give antiviral treatment um, to um, patients who are, have suspected influenza. In hospitalized patients, um, the Infectious Diseases Society of America has recommended um, molecular assays, including RT-PCR uh, for influenza for patients with suspected influenza. And the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines recommends uh, multiplex assays that detect influenza and SARS-CoV-2 uh, in hospitalized patients with acute respiratory illness. And that's again to detect uh, either co-infection or to distinguish between influenza or SARS-CoV-2 because uh, as Dr. Rupp mentioned, both um, treatment as well as infection prevention control measures are somewhat different. Um, and just to mention that in hospitalized patients, we do not recommend um, use of influenza antigen detection tests or immunofluorescent assays, which are also antigen detection tests. And the reason is for the lower sensitivity. And then just of a note, um, IDSA also mentions that for immunocompromised patients who might have many, many uh, potential respiratory pathogens, you may want to test for more than just SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A and B and other respiratory pathogens. Um, and just some key points, do not order, order viral culture for suspected um, influenza patients because of the time it's going to take. It's going to take days to get a result from viral culture. It's not going to inform um, 
uh, management of the patient. And also do not order serology for influenza. There are commercial laboratories that do offer um, influenza serology, do not order it. And the reason is you can't interpret a single uh, serology results on a single serum specimen. You really need paired acute and convalescent sera. So collected two to three years, of, uh, two to three weeks apart. And that really has to be done at specialized laboratories or public health laboratories. It's, it's, um, so don't order serology for influenza. That's really for epidemiological studies, vaccine studies, and for public health purposes. So just a few words about influenza um, uh, specimens and sampling. So influenza viruses are detectable for about three to four days um, by antigen detection, really drop off, and then about five to seven days by nucleic acid detection in those with uncomplicated disease. Uh, you can detect for a bit longer in infants and, and persons who are immunosuppressed may, may have detectable virus for um, actually many weeks. Um, and in general, the highest yield for influenza viruses is through sampling the nasopharynx. So a nasopharyngeal swab is the optimal specimen, ideally collected within the first three to four days of onset. However, a lot of patients don't like to uh, nasal uh, an NP swab to be collected. A lot of uh, people don't know how to correctly uh, collect an NP swab. So nasal swabs or a combined nasal or throat swab is actually um, uh, fine as well. And then for very young infants, the nasopharynx is not well developed. So an aspirate or a, um, of the nasopharynx or a nasal aspirate is also okay. Um, people who have more severe disease um, have slower clearance of influenza viruses that may be able to be still detected uh, more than a week after illness onset. And then with uh, immunosuppression, um, people who are treated with corticosteroids for other reasons, um, you can have prolonged uh, viral replication and, and detection of, of virus. Um, so in hospitalized patients, in particular in those who are intubated, um, those, there can be prolonged viral replication in, in the lower respiratory tract that's detected even after virus is cleared from the upper respiratory tract. So if you suspect influenza and you only sample the upper respiratory tract and it's negative, um, you should consider sampling the lower respiratory tract um, with the endotracheal aspirate, for example, if the patient is intubated. And the reason is that there may still be ongoing viral replication in the lower respiratory tract. And we know from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, up to 20% of patients uh, in critically ill adult ICUs um, were missed by only sampling the upper respiratory tract. And the diagnosis was made by sampling the lower respiratory tract. Um, in terms of antiviral treatment, um, Although there are more than four FDA approved antivirals, we do recommend only four. Um, these are three neuraminidase inhibitors, also Tamivir, Zanamivir, and Paramivir, and also the uh, polymerase inhibitor. It's really a cap dependent and a nuclease inhibitor, Biloxivir. So these all have um, been demonstrated to have efficacy in clinical trials for early treatment when patients are started on treatment within two days of illness onset. Um, with uncomplicated disease. Um, and just to note that uh, these drugs have different routes of administration. Also, Tamivir is an orally administered drug. It can also be given um, through oral or nasogastric tube to an intubated patient. Um, and Biloxivir is also an oral drug, whereas Zanamivir is an inhaled powder and, and Paramivir is an intravenous drug. And so there are also differences in the recommended ages uh, for treatment. Um, so CDC recommends the use of oseltamivir for treatment of uh, a patient of any age. Uh, Zanamivir is FDA approved for treatment in people five years and older. Paramivir approved for two years and older. And Biloxivir is approved for 12 years and older. So there are some differences. Um, there are no um, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trials of any of these drugs uh, for hospitalized patients. Now, um, just to uh, sort of hit this uh, uh, issue of who is at high risk for influenza complications, as Dr. Rupp mentioned, the, almost the same for, as for 
high-risk groups for COVID-19, just to point out that young children, uh, particularly less than two years old, but really uh, we consider less than five years old, are considered to be at high risk for influenza complications, and the risk is highest for those the younger you get. Um, and then uh, older adults, pregnant women, and those who are postpartum up to about two weeks after delivery, American Indians, Alaska Natives, um, children who are receiving long-term aspirin therapy because of the risk of Rye syndrome if, you have, um, in, if they have influenza, and then persons with uh, underlying medical conditions, uh, pulmonary cardiac, immunosuppression, neurologic and neurodevelopmental conditions, persons with um, um, extreme obesity, and then residents of nursing homes and chronic care facilities. And we also do, we have seen um, 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 differences in health inequities um, with um, certain and racial and my, minority groups so are at increased risk for hospitalization. And these disparities include non-Hispanic, Black, Hispanic, or Latino, American Indian or Alaska Native persons, all constitute persons who may be at high risk for influenza complications. And therefore, we do recommend antiviral treatment for high-risk persons uh, with influenza or suspected influenza. Um, so our CDC antiviral treatment recommendations are prioritized uh, on uh, prompt treatment um, should be initiated and it's focused on those with severe disease or those at highest risk of influenza complications. So we recommend antiviral treatment should be started as soon as possible for patients with confirmed or suspected influenza who are hospitalized. This is without waiting for the results of testing. Uh, outpatients with complicated or progressive illness of any duration and outpatients who are at high risk for influenza complications. For people who are not considered to be health uh, high risk, so previously healthy non-high risk patients, um, if they present with suspected uncomplicated influenza within uh, two days of illness onset, um, it's, a, it's basically clinical judgment. You can uh, treat them empirically. Um, uh, 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 and they, they will benefit, but they'll also, uh, they're also uh, likely to recover without treatment. And certainly we wouldn't recommend treatment for those people um, uh, if they present after 48 hours. It's really those who have more severe disease, um, don't, who don't need to be hospitalized, those who are at high risk for influenza complications, who present at any time, and then those who are hospitalized, who we really want to prioritize treatment for. So um, what, what's sort of the basis? So we do recommend oseltamivir treatment for hospitalized patients uh, with confirmed or suspected influenza. We do recommend waiting for test results. As I mentioned, there's no placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trials um, of oseltamivir or any of the other um, antiviral drugs versus placebo in hospitalized patients. However, there's a lot of observational studies, and uh, some of the studies have... Um, uh, reported that uh, starting a neuraminidase inhibitor treatment, uh, and it basically means oseltamivir, within six hours of admission or at the time of admission was associated with shorter duration of hospitalization. Uh, we do not recommend the use of inhaled zanamivir or baloxivir uh, in hospitalized patients because of the lack of data. Um, and the, we don't have much data about paramivir treatment of hospitalized influenza patients, but for patients in the ICU who are intubated and particularly those who cannot tolerate or absorb an oral or enterically administered drug such as oseltamivir, um, then intravenous paramivir uh, is an option for treatment. Um, and what we don't know is, is what's the op optimal duration of treatment for critically ill patients. So that's a, that's a gap area. So um, we do recommend, again, patients with complications, um, progressive disease um, of any duration, um, again, greater than two days, it's okay. We would initiate treatment with oral oseltamivir as soon as possible. And then um, if they have... Uh, uh, patients have uncomplicated influenza in the outpatient setting. Um, any of the drugs uh, can be used for early treatment, depending upon um, different uh, age approval groups and contraindications. Just to mention that in one clinical trial, baloxivir had um, greater efficacy than oseltamivir in high-risk adolescents and adults with influenza B virus infection. In addition, oseltamivir 
um, has a much greater impact on um, reducing viral load in the upper respiratory tract within 24 hours after a single dose administration and also then oseltamivir or placebo. So um, Biloxivir has virologic as well as clinical advantages. So some, some special groups just to mention for pregnant women, um, we do recommend oral oseltamivir, including up to women up to two weeks postpartum. We do not recommend biloxivir because um, there's no efficacy or safety data in pregnant or lactating women. Uh, for immunocompromised persons, we do not recommend biloxivir monotherapy because of the lack of data um, and the concern for um, uh, emergence of, of biloxivir resistant variants. We do recommend uh, neuraminidase inhibitor treatment in immunocompromised patients. It is important to monitor for antiviral resistance um, and also to maintain infection prevention control recommendations to reduce nosocomial transmission risk because such patients can shed virus for prolonged periods, many weeks or longer. Um, and um, just to say that this is a gap area where we need um, to look at combination antiviral treatment. So, um, just to mention a couple things about um, patients who are being hospitalized with influenza and COVID, both in the differential, either suspected or uh, confirmed. Just to mention that um, approved uh, FDA-approved antiviral med medications for influenza do not have any effect on COVID-19. So also Tamivir and Biloxivir don't have any in vitro activity against SARS-CoV-2. And also these drugs have no drug interactions with remdesivir. Um, corticosteroids may prolong um, influenza viral replication in the upper respiratory tract, um, and it's just something to be uh, taken care of. We would uh, still recommend dexamethasone if you have a patient with COVID-19 and influenza because of the benefit of dexamethasone treatment of severe COVID-19, um, but um, for patients with influenza alone, uh, there have been some um, conflicting studies, but certainly high dose corticosteroids have been implicated in uh, prolonged influenza viral replication and potentially with um, increasing the risk of, of uh, mortality. And just to say uh, that with influenza, we see typically see much higher um, frequency of community acquired secondary bacterial co infection. So, for example, uh, secondary bacterial pneumonia, it's much more common than with with influenza than with COVID-19. COVID-19, you can see community-acquired bacterial co-infection, but it appears to be uncommon. And so that if you suspect the patient has influenza or confirmation of influenza, um, you should think about potential uh, secondary bacterial co-infection, particularly with uh, Staph aureus, pneumococcus, and group A strep. So um, just thanks to Dr. Rupp for the next two slides. So just a couple things um, to summarize. So for patients, um, uh, patients in the outpatient or inpatient setting should be tested for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and for the outpatient setting, test for influenza if the results will change clinical management or infection control uh, management. So for example, if it's a patient referred to the outpatient clinic or emergency department for from a long-term care facility or other congregate setting, there may be a good reason to test for influenza, um, but you can prescribe empiric um, antiviral treatment for patients with suspected influenza who have more progressive disease or at high risk of influenza complications. You don't have to test, so test for influenza if it will change clinical management. But for hospitalized patients, definitely test, uh, implement appropriate infection prevention and, and control measures, Test for both pathogens, ideally use um, molecular assays. Uh, if you don't have multiplex assays available, then use uh, separate molecular assays for both. And we do not recommend uh, use of influenza antigen detection assays in hospitalized patients. Um, don't delay um, influenza treatment if influenza is suspected or a possibility uh, while waiting testing results. So this slide summarizes the NIH COVID-19 treatment panel guidelines uh, when uh, influenza viruses and SARS-CoV-2 viruses are circulating, so during influenza season. 
So antiviral treatment of influenza is the same in all patients with or without SARS-CoV-2 infections. It's a strong recommendation. It's expert consensus. So you can refer to CDC and IDSA guidance for um, uh, more details. And the panel uh, recommends that hospitalized patients with suspected influenza be started on empiric antiviral treatment for influenza with oseltamivir as soon as possible without waiting for influenza test results. Also, strong recommendation, moderate um, quality uh, evidence, and that you can stop antiviral treatment for influenza when influenza has been ruled out by a molecular assay, so nucleic acid um, amplification assay, detection assay in upper respiratory tract specimens for non-intubated patients, and then both upper and lower respiratory tract specimens for intubated patients. Just to highlight that um, on the CDC web pages, we do have some uh, resources about influenza testing, including some algorithms when um, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza viruses are co-circulating. This is an algorithm uh, um, for all patients, uh, either in the outpatient or the, um, th this one is uh, just the outpatient or ED setting. And this one uh, just goes into it a little bit more, um, not requiring hospitalization. And this one is specifically focused on patients who are requiring hospital admission for acute respiratory illness. So I'd like, like to turn it over to Dr. Simonson for the pediatric presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Uecki. That was really helpful uh, guidance on uh, not just testing decisions, but sampling as well as antivirals. So next up to round out our presentation today is Dr. Kari Simonson. She's an infectious disease uh, pediatrician by uh, training, and she is the chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and pediatrician in chief at the Children's Hospital as well here in Omaha. So Dr. Simonson, over to you. Thank you so much, Shelley, and thanks for the opportunity to kind of round out our discussion today with a few key considerations for kids. Um, so just a reminder that influenza does have a major impact on children as well. They're actually the population group with the highest attack rate, particularly our kids who are in schools and um, mingling with other kids all day long. They also play a crucial role in the transmission of influenza within our communities. Um, they do experience uh, morbidity and some complications from influenza. And we heard already in the discussion that uh, kids under five, and in particular, those under two are considered a high risk group. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. In thinking about the distinguishing features of influenza and COVID, you know, we did uh, hear a bit from Dr. Rupp about that as well. Um, but thinking about flu as having an uh, incubation period that's a bit shorter um, and the clinical presentations being similar enough that we do recommend diagnostic testing to discern one infection from the other. And again, um, that pediatric populations are the group for whom that uh, potentially distinguishing feature of gastrointestinal symptoms is less distinguishing. More kids can have GI symptoms with flu and also with COVID. So we also uh, shared in that global experience as pediatricians of having very low flu activity last season um, and dramatically fewer illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths related to flu. Um, the CDC actually had only one pediatric flu death recorded last season. And so, of course, we know there are many mitigating factors, uh, in particular, the um, lack of school activity and daycare activity for our kids last season. Um, that was also coupled with high rates of flu vaccination last year. So again, thinking about the importance of uh, continuing those uh, risk mitigation strategies in, in settings like schools, uh, and then getting the word out about the importance of pediatric vaccination. So let's think about sort of the effectiveness of flu vaccine in kids for a moment. Um, and just a recognition of how important flu vaccine is for children in preventing severe illness and death. Um, and so the two papers that are highlighted here, the first paper uh, looked at PICU hospitalizations uh, from a national network of sites 
And um, the vaccinated children were 74% uh, less likely to be admitted to the PICU um, versus PICU controls and 82% less likely to be admitted to the PICU versus community controls than their unvaccinated peers. So certainly that was highly protective for the vaccinated population. An important caveat that we'll draw upon here again in the next couple of slides is that some children do need two doses of flu vaccine to be fully protected. And for those who had only gotten one of the recommended two doses, they did not have that degree of protection from severe illness. Um, the second paper looks at flu deaths um, and the um, vaccine protectiveness was 26% um, of uh, pediatric deaths were in patients who had been vaccinated versus 48% of pediatric uh, deaths in unvaccinated uh, comparators. Uh, so the vaccine effectiveness against mortality in this group of kids from the 2010 to 2014 seasons was 65% effective against mortality. So um, strong uh, protection from the flu vaccine in our vulnerable children. Uh, the recommendations are that everyone over six months of age needs to get a flu vaccine. And so that's very straightforward. Um, although there are some caveats for who needs two doses as recommended by um, the CDC and AAP. We've heard um, a bit about um, some precautions and contraindications, but those are summarized here for you as well. Go ahead, next slide. I wanna talk through the who needs two doses. Um, so six months to eight years of age, if they have not previously received two doses in one season, um, they should uh, receive six, uh, two doses at least four weeks apart the first time they get flu vaccine um, or uh, if they haven't received two lifetime doses. So this is a handy little algorithm that's put together by the AAP as a reminder of um, which kids need that second dose. Um, and the goal here is, of course, that kids are fully vaccinated by the end of October, beginning of November. So young kids um, and infants in their first year of flu vaccine uh, receipt need to be prioritized for early um, recall to get those vaccines started. Um, and this is uh, from the CDC, also just um, a reminder that um, flu and COVID vaccines can be co-administered and uh, without regard to timing of other vaccines. And as Dr. Rupp highlighted earlier, we have kids who have been delayed in their usual childhood vaccinations due to the, the pandemic. So making sure we're recalling patients into our clinics and catching them up to date, uh, including getting them vaccinated for flu and COVID-19. And thinking about antiviral treatment, as we've heard in kids, um, antivirals are recommended for influenza as early as possible for patients with confirmed or suspected flu who are severely ill, hospitalized, or at high risk. We have heard that our youngest kids are included in that high risk group, as well as those kids on long term aspirin and particular population groups uh, where they might have um, increased risk. And then antivirals can be considered for those not meeting that high risk definition if started within 48 hours of illness. This is an AAP summary uh, chart for uh, antivirals for influenza in young kids. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight, um, although we've seen this um, before, was just the addition of the adverse effects and making sure we're letting families know in particular uh, nausea and vomiting with Tamiflu can be an issue for children. So making sure we're counseling parents and kids about that when prescribing Tamiflu. But the most important message that I wanna make sure we leave with is that kids uh, need to be vaccinated uh, for influenza. And then also we need to get our kids in who are eligible now for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the best place to vaccinate kids is in their medical home where they have a physician that knows their medical history and their family is comfortable with that setting. So as pediatricians, you know, we really feel strongly that we wanna get these vaccines um, out to families and catch kids up on any uh, routine vaccinations at the same time. And making sure that our clinical settings are continuing to adapt to local uh, conditions with the ongoing pandemic to maintain safety 
safety, as you may be recalling uh, higher volumes of patients through the clinic for uh, vaccine visits, making sure that we don't neglect those infection prevention uh, needs to keep everyone safe. And one of the innovative opportunities that I think we're doing a lot of now that we hadn't been in the past are, are things like um, lower touch uh, vaccine clinics like drive throughs and mobile units and getting out to where our population is. So thank you so much for um, this opportunity and, and please help us get out there and vaccinate uh, those kids and their families. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simonson. Um, Given the time, uh, I hope anybody who asked a question, our speakers were able to get to all of those questions. So I'll give you a couple minutes to go to the Q&A and sort of look at those responses um, if you haven't already. And I'll cover a, a few final uh, details, but I really just wanna thank our speakers today. I think uh, we can hope for the best, but I think today, you know, at least we have some tools in the toolkit for uh, ways to approach uh, the very likely potential of uh, both of these situations, COVID and influenza, becoming um, a, a significant issue for the whole United States. So with that, a few closing comments here. Make sure that you send any questions that you have to info at needtech.org. We'll help you. Uh, if you need any technical assistance, please let us know. Again, go to needtech.org and it says, ask an expert a question. Just click on that and one of us will get back to you. We're on lots of different social media channels. The audio as well as the slides today of all of our presentations being live will be Monday, uh, most likely onto the needtech.org website. So if you missed it or you want to send it to somebody, please go out there and grab it. And again, thank you for joining us today for the COVID-19 Tech webinar series. And we wish you a great weekend. Thank you. Stay safe.